All right, thank you, Steve. And I'd just like to welcome everybody here. And it's, it's nice to see this uh, nice large group here this morning. We've been doing a lot of presentations over the last couple months uh, in regards to cover crops. And, uh, and it's kind of a hot topic and we wanna keep that going and, and kind of tie it in with this nutrient loss reduction strategy. So that's what I kind of hope to, to, uh, for us to look at here today, uh, the cover crops role in the nutrient loss reduction strategy. And as Steve said, I've had a long background in uh, working with the Soil and Water Conservation District back in Montgomery County, uh, working a lot with landowners, uh, doing conservation planning, and also recently uh, working with the Council on Best Management Practices um, as a cover crop specialist in, uh, in this part of the state. So the uh, Illinois Council of Best Management Practices is made up of a lot of different ag organizations, the Illinois Farm Bureau, Corn Growers, Soybean Association, uh, IFCA, Syngenta, Monsanto, Growmark, a lot of good uh, agriculture organizations coming together to uh, promote uh, best management practices. So our mission basically to assist and encourage the adoption of best management practices to protect and enhance the natural resources and the sustainability, which is very important in uh, agriculture in Illinois. Um, some of our goals, try to effective, identify effective, environmentally sound, uh, sustainable best management practices, um, and one of which we'll talk about today cover, being cover crops, but also uh, try to increase that voluntary adoption, you know, and that's what I want to stress as well is that this nutrient loss reduction strategy is just a voluntary conservation effort. Um, so try to, we're trying to uh, communicate, you know, some of the best management practices that are out there and what the, and what the uh, benefit might be on your farms. Um, so this is just kind of the coverage area of, uh, of the state of Illinois, um, cover the purple area there for CBMP. Uh, we recently have, um, we're able to get the entire state of Illinois covered with uh, cover crop specialist and, and uh, Dick Lyons is also here today, um, covers the blue area here as well. So we've got good representation across the state and, and just trying to get the, uh, get the word out. So what can cover crops do, do for us as it pertains to nutrient loss? Um, so we know that cover crops effectively reduce both nitrate nitrogen and total phosphorus losses, but they also, produce, they also improve the soil tilth and, also, and other soil properties. So we know from uh, the other speakers we've heard from today, you know, a lot of the benefits, but cover crops and, and single species cover crops don't have just one specific benefit. They have a lot of different benefits and ultimately um, we're gonna reduce that nitrate and phosphorus losses on the farms. The adoption of cover crops um, maybe the, provide the best means and I'll kind of show you that later. We've, we've seen some slides that show from the nutrient loss reduction strategy, the benefit of uh, cover crops and the overall reduction in those losses. And I think, um, you know, from, from my perspective, cover crops probably have the single largest infield benefit um, for these losses. Um, but we can't just transition to this type of system. It's gonna take some management. It's gonna take some planning. So I'll talk a little bit about that today as well um, as we transition into doing more cover crops on our, on our farms the management and the planning that's gonna be needed. Um, so we can utilize cover crops um, to absorb and recycle those soil nutrients. Um, we can also help that, help improve the fertilizer use efficiency by doing that, by recycling those nutrients. Um, without uh, cover crops, we may lose some of those nutrients. And in agriculture and farming, no year is the same. We saw in 2012 where we had a drought year, we had a lot of excess nutrients out there after harvest. Um, those nutrients could have potentially been lost. Uh, but with cover crops, we can recapture those nutrients, recycle them, make them available, and prevent the potential loss of those nutrients. Um, because no year is the same, cover crops help level, level that out um, and help uh, provide some insurance for those nutrients. Um, we can also look at fast growing cover crops to provide large amounts of biomass as, as Lowell showed earlier. Um, we can do this in a pretty short period of time in the fall if we get it planted at the right date. Um, most of our grasses, legumes, and brassicas like our radishes and turnips, 
they have the capacity to re reduce the nitrate levels and also recycle those nutrients. And so that's what we primarily focus on when we're looking at uh, cover crops, things like cereal rye, annual ryegrass, um, and those, and those uh, radishes. But the amount of that that's captured and recycled um, is one of the most important um, features whenever we're looking at the different cover crop species. So we want to target our cover crop species for what we're trying to accomplish there uh, in those fields. So what is a cover crop? You know, a cover crop does a whole lot of different things and, and uh, primarily used to control erosion, slow erosion, and um, that's primarily, you know, where we're seeing our phosphorus losses, obviously, from, from erosion. So if we, if we can protect that soil with, with cover crops, we're going to prevent and even uh, slow and even prevent that erosion. We're also going to improve the soil health. A uh, big topic right now is, is showing some of the ways that uh, cover crops improve that soil health. Enhance the water availability as we, uh, as we make uh, more macropores and things in the soil structure and, and we improve the soil structure. We're able to infiltrate water better, which is going to lead to uh, uh, better water holding capac capacities. Um, also, bring increase our biodiversity on the farm, in the soil, and a whole lot of other benefits. So, how does this all tie into the nutrient loss reduction strategy? We've probably seen this map a couple times up here earlier, but um, you know we can look at our nitrate losses and our phosphorus losses in our particular watershed in this part of the state um, and see what we need to, uh, what we need, what type of best management practices we need to do to, to prevent those losses. Um, so ag runoff we know is a significant source of that uh, loading into our Illinois water bodies. Um, total losses are typically due to soil erosion, um, while well, nitrates are coming from the, our field tiles um, via tile drainage. Um, but both, nit both nutrients can be lost um, by both routes and, and affect surface and groundwater quality as well. Um, so ag runoff contributes, I think we, we've heard this before this morning, about 80% of the nitrate and 48% of the total phosphorus. Um, Non-point source, um, estimated about 10 pounds per acre per year. Um, you know, and we've, we've got the water testing kits in the, or the water testing kit in the back and we're, uh, some, several of you actually brought in samples today, which was great. We were able to take a look at those samples and, and uh, run those samples this morning for you individually. And, and we don't, uh, we don't uh, collect any of that data, um, and hopefully there will be more opportunities for testing to be able to test what's coming out of your tiles, tile lines to see what type of load there is. And if we can calculate the flow, then we can, uh, we can, we can see, you know, where are you at, how many pounds per acre per year, um, are you losing through your tile line and, and what practices um, as, as you convert to other practices are they helping uh, those losses. So looking at cover crops and you know what they do for the nutrient loss reduction strategy probably hard to read from back there but cover crops on all coin and soybean acres 30 percent reduction so in uh, phosphorus. So just by doing one practice um, we can meet our intermediate goal of 25% reduction of phosphorus just by doing cover crops on our fields. Um, cover crops on fields that are eroding, that are more highly erodible, that'll even go up higher to almost 50, go up to 50%. So, you know, as we've seen, you know, if we can keep the soil in place and prevent soil erosion with cover crops, we can drastically re reduce that uh, phosphorus loss on those fields. Also, water quality is going to improve with cover crops uh, as we protect those areas of runoff. Um, the water is going to be a lot, lot better quality coming off those fields. This is a, this is a picture that was taken this December. We had about anywhere from 8 to 10 inches of rain in our area. Um, and this is a picture of a field uh, without cover crops on it. And these pictures were actually right across the road from each other. And, and uh, just the drastic difference in what was coming off of those fields um, is, is, is just incredible. And as we have, it seems that we're having more uh, uh, different type of rainfall events, heavier rainfall events, uh, it seems ever more important to protect those areas um, as much as we can throughout the, 
throughout the winter. So when we look at nitrate reduction, again, we look cover crops have about a 30% reduction um, on tile drained acres as well as uh, non tile drained acres. So another big impact. So what's actually going on with cover crops? Uh, whenever we plant cover crops in the fall, we're able to um, take up those excess nutrients uh, that weren't used by the previous crop, um, hold them in the plant tissue until that plant decays the following sp spring and then hopefully used by that next crop. So um, basically a process that's going on and different, crop, different cover crops are gonna release those nutrients at different times um, during the growing season. Um, this is, I don't know how well this is to see back there, but this, this field is, uh, this picture was taken in the spring of 2013. Um, in the spring of 2013, um, if you can see, we have some very dark green strips out here in this field. Um, 2012 was obviously a very dry year. Uh, this was side, this field was side dressed previously, and that, uh, Nitrogen was never basically used by the corn. It never, it never moved anywhere, and you could still see the strips where that uh, nitrogen was at. And the point of this slide is that without these cover crops out there, those nitrates could have potentially been lost. Um, but we were able to capture them, recycle them for the next crop. So we can manage uh, soil organic matter. Um, by planting cover crops, we can potentially increase our soil organic matter. Uh, if we increase our organic matter, we're going to increase that water holding cap capability. Uh, soil organisms are also going to increase. Um, soil structure is going to be, be better. We may be planting some cover crops that uh, are breaking up some of those compaction layers, creating more uh, root, uh, greater root depth out there. And ultimately, we're going to have better water quality, better air quality as a result of that. So cover crops, um, like I said earlier, cover crops, you know, we don't just plant uh, cereal rye and get one benefit out of it. We're getting a whole lot, a whole host of benefits out of our cover crops, uh, all the way from reducing erosion to uh, pest control. We're seeing a lot of good results with, uh, you know, soybean cyst nematode reductions from cover crops uh, behind annual rye grass and cereal rye. Um, adding organic matter, the microbial activity that's going on in those fields, uh, weed suppression, uh, a lot of good benefits. So when we look at cover crops to enhance soil health, basically what's going on there is we're gonna speed the infiltration of excess surface water, uh, let that water go down into the soil instead of running off, um, relieve, relieving compaction and improving the structure of that over typically over tilled soil. So we can look at uh, less tillage, more cover crops um, is gonna help improve that structure over time. Organ adding, again, or adding organic matter and enhancing nutrient cycling. So all of these things are contributing to o the overall soil health. And, and the point I wanna get, get across this morning is that we need to look at managing our soil before we manage the crop that we're gonna plant. Um, First, the first thing we need to do is manage that soil in our fields and then focus on managing the crop. So the two main uh, keys to success are planning um, and then management. So planning, planning your cover crop, and I would encourage you if you're thinking about doing cover crops or you uh, are gonna do cover crops again this year to start thinking about it now. Um, now is the time to start planning for cover crops um, you may want to look at planting an earlier variety of soybeans, an uh, earlier maturing hybrid of corn on some of these fields that are going to be going to cover crops. So take that into consideration because the planting is, is also uh, a key to success. Um, also working with your re herbicide retailers, we're seeing a lot of uh, herbicide carryover in the fall. So important to know what you're going to be putting on those fields this spring and summer and what potential effects that might have on your cover crop this fall. Um, the last thing we want to do is have you go out and spend 20 or $30 an acre on cover crops only to find that you had some herbicide carryover and uh, you weren't able to get any of your cover crops to grow. So, so take that into consideration this spring as well. Uh, if you're trying cover crops for the first time, maybe look at doing a smaller amount of acres to try to get started to get a feel for it. Um, 
Also work with your local soil and water conservation district, um, the NRCS offices. Uh, work with those guys. They may have potential programs that are available, but they also are a wealth of knowledge uh, for some of, these, uh, some of these practices. And also work with fellow, uh, your fellow farmers. How many of you guys in here have planted cover crops in the past? So utilize these guys. These guys are probably the greatest resource that you have around here because they've, they farm around this area. They've, they've worked with cover crops. They know what's worked for them. They know what rates have worked. They know the best termination uh, techniques and things like that. So work with those guys, very important. Uh, also, when you're looking at uh, purchasing your seed, um, you know, I would, I would look at purchasing seeds sometime in the summer. Um, make sure you're purchasing high quality seed. Make sure you know what you're getting. Um, make sure you're not getting a VNS, a variety not stated, uh, when, especially when you're looking at annual ryegrass and things like that, that you're getting a variety that's going to be conducive for this area. So cover crop seeding dates, uh, very important. You know, the, the seeding date is going to be very much dependent on the benefit that you're going to get out of that cover crop. Um, we look at seeding radishes, rapeseed, clovers, annual ryegrass, usually September 15th, September 20th time frame, depending on where you're at in the state. Uh, but very important so that we can get six to eight weeks of good growing season on those cover crops so that we'll get some, some good benefit out of it. Uh, oats, we can go a little bit later. Uh, cereal rye, we can plant that pretty much any time. I would target, you know, somewhere around October 1st for cereal rye to get good erosion control throughout the winter. But your size and health, as I said, is going to be largely dependent on that planting date. Uh, so many times I've seen guys go out and plant in, uh, towards, the end of or towards the end of September, and uh, if we don't get a good growing season in the fall, something like brassicas, uh, you know, you may not get a whole lot of growth out of to, do, to get a whole lot of benefit. And uh, as ag economics become increasingly uh, tighter, margins are a little bit tighter, it's important that we look at that before we, spend, um, before we spend $30 an acre or something on cover crops. So some of the seeding methods, also something to, to consider, you know, what type of seeding method are you going to be looking at this fall whenever you go out to do your cover crops? Um, I always tell people, that, you know, if you want to be successful with cover crops to manage it as a crop. And in order to do that, you'd want to drill it or plant it with a, with a planter. We've got a lot of guys doing precision type seeding uh, with a planter. Um, but we also have to take into consideration that we've got a lot of other things going on in September and October. We've got harvest activities um, that are at the forefront of that time. So, you know, there are other methods that we can use um, and still be successful. Uh, airflow or a spreader type seeding can be very successful. Um, you can mix that in with your fertilizer, uh, lightly uh, vertical till that, that seed and fertilizer in. If you're using DAP, you can help take up some of that, that uh, nitrogen in the DAP that could potentially be lost as well um, and help kickstart that cover crop. Um, also, aerial seeding can be done. Um, it's, it's success is widely dependent on the, uh, you know, the timing of it. Um, need to make sure there's decent soil moisture there if we're, if we're flying those cover crops on. Uh, things like annual ryegrass and cereal rye are a little more forgiving than, uh, than our brassicas whenever we're aerial seeding them. We also have to look at increasing our rates when doing aerial seeding um, in, order to get, in order to get good stands. But we also want to look at uh, on soybeans doing that aerial seeding whenever the leaves are turning yellow uh, and when, when the corn plant has about 50% of, of the light getting down to the soil surface. Um, and that's increasingly harder with some of the hybrids that we have today that have a lot of leaf surface and getting that, uh, getting that light down there. And also making sure that harvest is going to take place in a timely manner after, after this aerial seeding. Um, some other things that guys are doing, uh, doing cover crops and then doing strip till after the cover crop is up. Um, this doesn't tear out a whole lot of, a whole lot of the cover crop, um, especially the cereal rye and annual ryegrass. A lot of that will come back over the top of those strips. Um, 
and does a very nice job. Ultimately, if we're doing an aerial seeding, this is kind of what we want it to look like whenever we are uh, harvesting the corn. Um, that cover crop has, has came up. Um, it's ready to take off and, and uh, that field is basically going to be protected throughout the winter. Other innovations, you know, guys are mounting seed boxes on vertical tillage type equipment to get the seeding done um, and look at getting over a lot of acres uh, in a short amount of time as opposed to drilling or, or using a planter. Of course, drilling, whenever we drill our cover crops, uh, we can reduce the, the uh, seeding rates, which can help uh, cover some of that expense for the drilling or planting. Um, on cereal rye, we can maybe go from 56 pounds to the acre down to 40 um, and still get good weed suppression with that. Um, also, just, this is just a photo of some vertical tillage done on corn stalks. You can still see the rows, um, kind of help lay those stalks over, get good seed to soil contact with that cover crop seed to get a good, to get a good seeding. And the ryegrass the same way, um, you know, Getting a good stand ahead of winter is very important so that it won't ki winter kill out. We've had some, some uh, problems with that in our area where we didn't get enough growth on it ahead of, uh, ahead of the winter and, and it actually winter killed out. So getting good growth on it uh, and then terminating it in the spring. So the biggest question I always get with cover crops is, you know, termination. That's, I say the guys, most farmers' greatest fear is how am I going to terminate my cover crop? Um, so a lot of guys trying things out will go with the oats and brassicas, the oats and radish type mix that's going to winter kill out. Don't have to worry about spraying it in the spring. Works very easy. Uh, we still leave ourselves exposed for erosion possibly for a couple months before planting, but, uh, but works very well for nutrient cycling and, uh, and some uh, soil erosion protection in the fall. Um, some guys are looking at terminating those cover crops after planting um, a day or two just so that it doesn't create a mat on the soil surface that could uh, um, cause excess soil moisture ahead of planting. Um, the earlier termination is going to release those nutrients quicker but at the same time we're not going to get as much organic matter uh, production out of those cover crops by terminating early. Um, and whenever we look at legumes, we want to terminate those uh, the later, the more nitrogen they're going to produce for us. And there's just kind of a note up there, cereal rye before corn, just be very cautious of cereal rye before corn. Um, and you do want to terminate that early because of the high carbon to nitrogen ratio that you'll have from cereal rye ahead of corn. Um, some, some more uh, experienced cover crop guys doing hairy vetch, producing a lot of nitrogen. Uh, no tilling into that hairy vetch, um, creating a nice mulch there as well. But again, talking about planting green, um, and, and this is typically what I like to do on my farm is, is, is uh, spray the cover crop a day or two before planting and then go out there and plant uh, no-till soybeans into that cereal rye. Works very well. Uh, just want to talk briefly about herbicide carryover. I'll go through this really quick. I said a few things earlier, but just be cautious with that. Uh, something we didn't worry a whole lot about five years ago. We're using a whole lot more uh, residual chemicals on our soybeans now than what we did before. And so uh, that's having an effect on our cover crops uh, in the fall. If you think you might have a uh, carryover problem, look at doing a bio essay, take some of that soil, plant some of your cover crop seeds in it ahead of harvest to know if you're gonna have some carryover. But uh, we may not always get uh, cover crops, you know, to germinate in the fall, but we can also have problems with just poor, poor growth. And they may not get enough growth on them to make it through the winter. Um, they also just may not produce a whole lot of biomass as well. So management is the other key. Um, select the right cover crop for your soils and for your farm. Select to correct those soil issues. Um, use a shovel, evaluate your soil and know what's going on. Know if you have some compaction layers. What, what does your structure, your soil structure look like on that farm? But see what those roots are seeing as well. See what your rooting depth is like. 
Um, we can use cover crops for moisture management in the spring. We can use them, use them to take moisture out of the soil. Um, and then later on, we can also use that cover crop to, to help mulch the soil, keep the soil surface at a lower temperature. Um, so in conclusion, uh, nutrient management can be accomplished effectively by using cover crops. So we can, you, we can utilize cover crops as part of our nutrient management plan uh, to absorb those excess nutrients um, to keep them from being lost. Um, the use of cover crops should, should be considered, if you're doing a nutrient management plan, consider doing cover crops as part of that plan uh, to prevent the loss of those existing nutrients. And as I said earlier, manage your soil first. So many times we look at, we, we put a lot of emphasis on managing our crop, but I think we need to look at doing a better job of managing our soil first and what we, that asset that we have there. Just some of the uh, Midwest Cover Crop Council website, uh, good site to go through, go to to look at uh, different species and, and seeding rates and seeding dates and things for your area. Um, I've also got some field guides in the back if anybody's interested. Uh, very good resource for seeding rates, also what that particular cover crop does for you. So just find me in, in the back there if you're interested in one of those. And then, of course, the Illinois CBMP website is also a good source uh, for a lot of upcoming dates and stuff. And, and we're hoping to do a lot of field days, um, hopefully looking with, uh, I'll just mention, we're going to do a, hopefully do a, a field day on Steve's farm, and I'm mentioning that so that Steve can't back out of it, so that <laughs> hopefully everybody will, uh, will be there. But looking at doing cover crops after wheat on Steve's farm, and, and kind of a different look at several different species of cover crops. So, so look at that website for updates um, on, on things that will be going on. That's all I have.